Hello everyone, um, so the Shooting Art Podcast is sponsored by The Rookies. There is simply no better way to launch your career and start sharing your amazing work online. Uh, throughout their website, you can create your own portfolio, enter lots of contests that take place all year round and has an incredible community for non-professional digital artists. Um, from hobbyists, students, self-taught artists to even people wanting to make a career change, the Rookies community brings everyone together allowing you to be surrounded by people on the same journey as you. So if you want to showcase your portfolio, grow as an artist and track your progress, sign up to the Rookies today. Hello everyone and welcome to the Share Art Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is episode 58 of the series. Um, the podcast is a weekly series where I bring on guests from the games and film industries to talk about their journey and thoughts on student education. Today on the show, we have another amazing guest for you. We have an amazing podcaster and artist, Gordon Neal, on the show. How you doing, man? Good to have you on. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for uh, inviting me to your podcast. This is awesome. It's, uh, I, I think I said this last time that it's really weird to be doing this, not only on somebody else's podcast, but also somebody else's podcast who is also Scottish. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> Team Scotland, we're on, we're on the yeah, right track. <laughs> yeah, man. Therefore, now there needs to be more Scottish artists because there's, there's like... You know, people, I think even recently, before we get into it, I was talking to a couple of guys at Lightbox in LA and they were saying, oh yeah, is there much game development in Scotland? I was like, Jesus, man, Grand Theft yeah. Auto's made here. Like, there's so, <laughs> there's so much history, like, of of just games in, in the UK in general, but Scotland especially, there's, yeah, there's a lot. So, there's, yeah, man. That's the thing, it's like, um, I don't know, but, like, I've realised that podcasts have kind of, um, they've certainly kind of escalated, they became more of a thing. However, yeah. Cause I'm not I'm not sure what they're called what the podcast called but one of my friends sent me another uh, podcast link the other day I need to go check it out in that but it's like it's mm-hmm. nice to see that things are kind of just you can see that slowly people are realizing right I have a voice I have something to say and it's really nice to kind of see yeah I think especially when I started the podcast and this is going back 2016 I mean I definitely wasn't the first I was inspired by listening to uh, Ash Thorpe on the Collective oh yeah and, yeah, yeah yeah good choice yeah. good choice. Uh, Ash Thorpe and uh, a couple of the guys at the time who who were doing uh, like cause it, Chris Chris Oatley Chris Oatley also does a podcast as well. Okay, um, a couple other guys. That, yeah, but I would generally was like, oh, I could do something like that because I'd worked on YouTube before doing video game stuff before. You know, like I had a passion for games before I got into art. So I'd run gaming channels and done reviews and stuff like that, and actually went to events for websites and mm-hmm. done some kind of games journals and stuff. Um, and then uh, kind of fell into obviously leaving my job at, at 28 and, and trying to pursue my dreams. So, but the 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 reason that I started the podcast at the time was because I found there wasn't, especially maybe 2015, 2016, there wasn't enough information really about um, the industry and how to get in and how to talk to people and what you should really be putting in your portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, it's getting more common knowledge these days, but back then, yeah, I had the same questions as most people and I felt like, if I'm asking these questions, I'd be as well doing it on a podcast scenario and then um, letting other people listen to those answers. And, you know, not only I would get them, but so with other people who were looking to, to enter the world of art and um, and Digital Artcast was born. That was the the first episode, I think, was June 2016. Wow, um, that's so, amazing, yeah, man. Nearly, nearly, nearly four years we've been doing it now, so, yeah. Because, like, like, that's the thing. So, like, before we even start, as always, folks, everyone's tuning in, make sure to go give Gordon a follow. Um, his podcast link will be in the description below. So he has it on YouTube, etc. cetera. And um, any other social media platforms that you tend to use? Yeah, most things. I mean, we've just actually switched the podcast over to Anchor, and Anchor have been really good because they distantly dig- distantly distribute the podcast on multiple sources. So mm-hmm. before we were on like iTunes and Spotify and YouTube, um, but now we're on like Google Podcasts and different stuff and Spotify and you know loads of other channels that we weren't on before. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely spreading. And there's a couple of websites we've just done deals with where. Um, they're basically just putting us front and center on their website as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then since we had the the A level article last year, we've been um, kind of talking back and forth with them and doing different kind of publishing and, and deals for trying to get more visibility on the podcast. But the article definitely sparked an interest more in, in what we were doing. And then recently, actually, because we spoke with Max Davenport, who was a Borderlands 3 artist, okay. um, the uh, CG Society picked up the the, the oh, podcast episodes. Oh, right, okay, that's sick. Yeah, so they've been, that's kind of give us a bit more visibility. And we're, we're so close to 2,000. We're, I think we're literally about 100 subscribers away from, from 2,000. So... 
So everyone, good. make sure to subscribe. Yeah. All good. <laughs> you, you got five seconds. You see the thing on the screen right now. Go subscribe to Corey's yeah. podcast. Make the most of it. You know subscribe how subscribe now. <laughs> yeah, Get in the podcast voice. <laughs> yeah, we're not continuous but, podcast until you subscribe. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, but yeah, man. So it's been it's been a really interesting journey. But uh, but yeah, it definitely feels like only yesterday I left my job. So that's yeah, mental. It's been, yeah. So when it comes to you as a whole, obviously we've kind of dived into like a wee bit of your life so far and that, but when it mm. comes to just art in general, like what kind of got mm. you into this path? Like why did you become an artist and how did things kind of like fall into place? I don't know if I actually call myself an artist these days, but oh, right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really weird question because I mean, I, I think it was different. My journey was different from a lot of people's because I did paint and draw and do other things artistic when I was younger but then I never studied it really as a you know like an avenue for a career um because when I left high school I didn't really know what I wanted to do so I ended up leaving um and kind of just get a floating in the wind for a while and then uh at the time my dad was working for uh, a railway company in the UK um Mm -hmm. and they were looking for apprentices so I joined at 18 and I'd done an engineering position for it was almost 10 years when I left. Oh, right. Awesome. Um, nice. Right, okay. Um, but then up until kind of just before I was leaving, I just wasn't enjoying, um, you know, I wasn't really enjoying the atmosphere. I wasn't enjoying the work. I was just feeling it was quite monotonous and not really what I wanted to do. And I always had a, a thing where, you know, games were definitely, you know, my entire life, a thing that I always enjoyed interacting with. I mean, especially when, you live on an island like we do. Yeah. Um, escape, yeah. Escape, escapism is worth its weight in gold. So, um, you know, when PlayStation came out and a couple other different uh, things along those years, like PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast and GameCube, um, I, I just got more and more into games. And then as the games got more advanced, they started shipping stuff like, you know, art books and making of DVDs. Mm-hmm. And I think the first one that I properly sat down and watched all the way through was the Halo 3 documentary. Oh, right. Okay. Um, nice, nice. So that, and I think at the time, possibly the God of War one as well. And then I also had my first art book, which was the Skyrim art book um, as well. So there was a couple of different things happened in succession, but I was definitely like, I wanted to do something in games and I didn't know at the time that there was a whole uh, art section of it where people could do, you know, 3D art or 2D art mm-hmm. and make things for video games. So, which is a very common thing, actually, that I think everybody I've interviewed has, has shared as well. The fact that nobody really knew that there was a job for making art for games. Like, they knew about programmers, they knew about sound design and, and level design and stuff like that, but people didn't know what a concept artist was. In fact, when I was kind of starting in 2012, mm-hmm. um concept artist was like a brand new title um because yeah. before then as i know from talking to people um the artist and the team used to be the guy on the team who could draw the best so whoever who could draw you know half decent figures or, or vehicles he was the person they would hire to do the art for the whole game um but then of course it became a specialized job over time mm-hmm. and now we have concept designers which has changed also as well because it was originally concept artist but now it's more concept designer but yeah when i left i was i was trying to do the basic stuff so i was drawing you know copying things out of comic books and and you know copying things out of uh websites that i found and trying to study as much as i could on different materials and and then interviewed or, or well actually maybe no interviewed but the first person i spoke to before i left my job was matt gazer and he because i just typed concept artist into google okay. and he was the first website that came up but what does he um, do <clears throat> matt gazer he's a matt is a, a former uh lucasfilm employee who oh, wow. worked on hey, awesome. nice. clone wars and a couple animated series um his first job actually was a background artist for rugrats so Real? that was oh, i've not heard yeah. that ages man yeah rugrats. Rugrats. it's such a classic um but then recently i think he's done uh like he done stuff for Cloudy for a chance to meet balls or previs. He done the Angry Birds movie and mm-hmm. he's done a couple other projects. He also does a set design for a, a thing called the Daydream Daydream Festival, which is in Sweden or Switzerland or something like that. But he designs that all this. He designs all the stages and all the the flyers and everything for it because um, his art is very fantastical. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just sent an email to Matt saying any advice on what I should be looking for. You know, when I go into the world of art or what I do concepts for games. How would you help me, you know, kind of move into that avenue? Is there any way you can give me advice or websites to look at? Because also at the time, he was very early on in his career. He was working for uh, Blizzard as well. And then I mean, recently he's done some stuff for Riot. But, I mean, he was just like, yeah, look at these kind of artists and, and get a feel for different 
bits of uh, books that you could look into, like Scott Robertson's books are really good. And yeah, he's great. First, he's amazing. First introduction. It's well, a, a great guy as well. And luckily, somebody else I've met because um, he was in he was in Edinburgh a couple of years ago. So he was on your podcast as well. He was, yeah, he was one of my my most requested guests, and we finally got him on. I think, God, it's like maybe two years ago, and I think we spoke to him. I can't remember, but wow. Um, but yeah, but um, it's it's been a great journey so far, and I think the the problem was. Or the problem I've had is that the last five years, maybe six years that I've been kind of chasing this dream, I've had a short time to really expand and experiment. And it's hard where, you know, every time you learn a bit more about the industry, you learn a new skill set or a new thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Um, People tend to, you know, stick to one thing and try to, you know, hone that craft. But I was so fascinated by different things and, and new techniques that I wanted to almost try and do everything um no i'm intrigued is, you said that because no, it's, yeah. it's a great point yeah i think it's just interesting where it, 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 it's kind of hard to think for anybody to sit down and be told like you're going to do this one thing for the next 40 years i think mm-hmm. in games it can be slightly difficult um because you know you want to do the concept as well as the 3d and then you want to do the the, the vfx as well but then it's the kind of jack of all trades scenario where if you're not super good at one thing but kind of all right a couple of things you, you do have generalists in studios but i think more now because studios are getting so big and just scale and size that yep. specifics and specialities are really what people will look for now i mean whenever you look for a job listing it's more like we need specifically a senior art director or a senior character artist you know it's not like you just need somebody yep. so I think that's where I've kind of fallen down over the last couple of years and, and, and it's been a bit harder. But then I give myself shit really, but then I've only really been pushing, I think, hardcore, um, you know, like, you know, going to events and, and meeting people and mm-hmm. trying to build a portfolio for maybe three years right, okay. um, since 2016. So, and I've only, you know, only graduated last year. and uh, Congratulations. I, thanks <laughs> it, was, <laughs> so, it, was, get... it was a long slog but yeah well i've done <laughs> i've done so many years because i left in 2012 and i went back to college to do initial just foundation art but then um i think i've done graphic design after that because i thought that'd be a good avenue to go down and then i think i graduated from that in 2014 and then i was like i still want to do something in games i don't want to give up yeah, so to do the I, thing you wanted to do yeah so i applied for universities and then I got into UWS, University of West of Scotland in Paisley. It was actually between that and Dundee, funnily enough. So I could have almost been your classmate, Ross. Oh, so dude, dude, yeah. you're missing out, man. Uh, <laughs> I would have been a great, I think the best classmate you could have ever had. Like you missed been it told, big time. Yeah, I've been told Aberté, apart from having some you know, really high standards, is because the program is one of the best in in the country um, uh, for was, games art. It was so f- it was so fun because like obviously we were talking about Ryan uh, beforehand. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then, like, that's the thing is, like, uh, so if everyone, I know, obviously, if you've watched my podcast till, till now, you've, you know, I've heard about, you. Uh, I've talked about Aberté, it's, what, 58 episodes in, surely you've <laughs> heard me mention yeah. it, but it's like, uh, when it comes to Aberté, it was kind of, um, how can I say it, it just, it just felt always like, like, I, I was saying to Ryan, because he came on for the, he was my first guest on the podcast, and he came on again uh, two weeks ago, and he, he just, it just feels like a family, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yes, it's, definitely. it's like, like, obviously it's great to learn all these different things and it's important to learn everything. And like you said, it's hard to keep up with the industry because of how rapidly things are going. But Alberta just does it in a way that you just, I don't know, it just always felt right. Yeah. I mean, Ryan's definitely an example. I mean, shout out to Ryan Locke, but, you know, I met him a couple of years ago at, uh, at a industry workshops mm-hmm. and he was just a phenomenal guy and, really dedicated to his, his craft and really um, wanting to push students into the, the limelight of getting to know the industry and, and getting to know what's current in the industry, especially. Because mm-hmm. um, I know he he was talking about, he was trying to meet with some artists during the talks to, to thank him. I think some artists at the time had got some guys in jobs and stuff like that. So he's, he's an example really of what uh, lecturers really should be in terms of the amount they should push their students or the amount they should really help them along in the industry. Yeah. Um, my course was not a bad mouth, obviously. The course was whatever it was, and it was great at the time. It really was. Um, but we did have a lot of lectures and positions where they had never really worked in a field at all. They had just kind of went academically through the whole thing and were now yeah. lecturers. 
um, not even in, in games or 3D art. I mean, one of them was uh, a media professor or a media lecturer right. who had done kind of like the BBC route and tried to do stuff for that. And um, the other one was like a, a computer kind of science uh, major. So the complete um, opposite then. Kind of same thing as well. Again, the one, <clears throat> or I say the one saving grace, we had a lot of good things in that course that kind of helped me along. But one of them was that they hired on um, one of their former students who had worked um, at Firebrand Games on the Need for Speed series. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when the studio had closed, they came back in and they gave him a, a shot at being a lecturer, um, which I think was more <clears throat> was more uh, apt at the time because we were just kind of hungry for industry news and, and things that we wanted to do that would make our portfolio better. Um, that and the fact that I had maybe one or two other people in the course who were like really super taking it seriously and you know, weren't maybe going to events like me, but we're definitely, you know, sitting in an art station daily and looking at what's the most relevant stuff and what yeah. should it be put in the portfolio. So um <clears throat> shout out to Kaz. But uh but yeah, so it just shows really I think at the end of the day when, you know, we all graduated, me and Kaz and um a couple other people who were really dedicated were the people who got jobs. Yeah. Um so, you know, I've I have i have been less, I suppose, lucky in that respect where a lot of the guys got maybe full-time gigs in a couple of months, but I've been more or less just full-time freelance doing just odd jobs to keep me going. Keep um, working which, on the side. Yeah, which I don't mind. I do enjoy that the freedom I have with the office, but I would love to go into a studio, you know, because luckily uh, through my time at UWS um, and, and going to industry workshops in 2016, um, that networking got me really my first gig, which was interning at Axis Studios in 2017. Um, and then you got was, to meet Yannick. Yeah, Yannick. Yannick was oh my god. Yeah, we we're just talking about him earlier. <laughs> His art is ridiculous, like absolutely ridiculous. Um, the yeah, guy, amazing. was making, making professional sweat. His, his sketchbook, he was so good. <laughs> um, and John was always blown away with his talent. So John Beeston, shout out to John. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I got the opportunity to go work there, and um, and at the time when I'm, I was working there or interning there, uh, they were working on a couple of projects. One which was, you know, unannounced, can't talk about that one, but yeah, they did work on Destiny 2 cinematics, mm-hmm. um, a League of Legends trailer, and I think Donny War, they were just finishing stuff up for that as well. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, they worked on a couple of projects while I was there, and it was just fascinating to see the whole behind the scenes and how people made things daily, and, and um, you know this yourself from recently going into a studio, you, you know, pull, pulling back the curtain and seeing what the day-to-day is like is yep. definitely eye-opening like you learn, and, uh, yeah well uh, yeah it's just the thing it's like you learn so much uh, once you've actually made that step and mm-hmm. like, like you'll know yourself like obviously freelance is different to um obviously being in-house etc but yeah then again it's that's the part and parcel and it's the, it's part of the fun in terms of the exploration the the learning curve overall like the one thing i did, did actually want to talk talk to you about etc was mm-hmm. actually like when it came to obviously you creating your name like for example through all these connections and through all these events like it would mm-hmm. just be great to just to hear your perspective on events and stuff. And uh, when did that whole kind of uh, thing become a thing? <sighs> when did that thing become a thing? Um, <laughs> when did events um, come yeah, around? You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 I know, I know. No, um, yeah, I, I think again it was 2016. It was when I had just um, started at university doing 3D. Um, I'd met a couple of people, and then I'd start going to an art station more and. I think it was, you know what it was? It was, uh, I was watching a sh- uh, an artist stream at the time on Twitch. Okay. Um, Anna Hollerick, shout out to Anna, um, who is now like a, a BAFTA award winning like artist. It's ridiculous. She's came so far. Wait, what's, um, her, what's her name again? Say it. Anna, Anna Hollenrake. Right, um, okay. I'm going to yeah. That's another name she's I don't a, know. There's so many names. A, <laughs> yeah, I know. She's a 2D artist from London, but she's, she's, oh, she's mad talented, right? Ridiculous. So, yeah. so talented. Awesome. Um, but yeah, so she was streaming and she was like, um, anybody else going to industry workshops? And I was like in the chat, like, what the fuck is industry workshops? Like, I've never <laughs> heard of it. And she was like, oh, it's this event in London, you know, a couple of my friends put on and, uh, you know, it's for industry artists and they do talks and demos. And I was like, well, that'd probably be quite interesting, actually, you know, to go out and, you know, meet people and m- maybe learn a bit more about the industry um, firsthand. But then, yeah, I mean, I was kind of in the, the, the position where, I, I'd actually spoke online a bit to a couple of people and I knew some people as well from the industry, mostly I can, you know, the, the, the initial people I met on Facebook who were like Suzanne Helmig and Tyus Lunter. And then 
you know, Paul Canavan as well in the UK and, and Edinburgh. And uh, yeah, I just kind of was talking amongst them saying, do you know much about uh, initial workshops? And they were like, yeah, it's a really good event. You should really go. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just booked a ticket, you know, from my train and for the event. And then I, I turned up in August in 2016 and my mind was blown because that was the year I got to meet John Beeston and Joe Wallace from Axis because um, wow. they instantly, instantly recognized the Scottish accent. Yep. <laughs> and then we went to the talks and met Ash Thorpe and Mike Hill and you know Marek Maggi done his talk on the Witcher stuff and you know just and Mike Hill in general Mike Mike's just a mad genius I mean the guy's doing talks at NASA now like he's just what? he's Yo, right, yeah okay. that's sick right okay did yeah. not expect that today yeah Mike Hill he started uh as a 3D artist I think and some game stuff but I mean he's worked on like initially he worked on like Guerrilla Games mm-hmm. uh franchises I think he done nice. Killzone and stuff cool um as like a concept designer but then He's done so much since then. Like his career is just. When I went in 2016, when I was standing next to Titus and he was talking to Mike, and I think York was next to me as well. And I, you know, Titus was like, "You need to go to Mike's talk. It's going to be one of the best." And he done his talk on Terminator Two. Oh, by the oh, way, a Ross, classic, I, a classic. I need, I, need, I need to send you the talk. It's unbelievable. He like, breaks down James Cameron's storytelling to oh, like the, the so nth degree. Um, but yeah, Mike now has worked on stuff like Blade Runner and the, like the film, the new the one with Ryan Gosling, like he worked on that and he's worked on, I think, possibly some Star Wars projects. But All my like, favourite types of movies. <laughs> he's done so much stuff now, it is ridiculous. He's one of the, the actual authorities on um, just sci-fi design in general. Mm-hmm. But it's funny now, look, but looking back, going to that event in 2016 and seeing where people's careers have went since then. Because a of lot course. of guys I was talking to at the time had already had like their 10 years in the industry and this was them, you know, coming towards like you know the kind of golden hour of 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 their career yeah and so many guys since then i've done such incredible stuff um but anyway so yeah going back to events yeah i went to the event and uh sat in all those talks and met all those people and it's had an incredible time and and it totally fired me up to go back to university and just do awesome work Mm -hmm. um and then since then i've went to i mean i'm looking around my walls in my office i used to do a thing um i kind of still do it but i've done it you know mostly when i was starting out where I would get the poster for the event and get everybody at the, the event to sign it. Um, and then I took them home and I framed them all in, the, in my office. So I've got all these these awesome... <laughs> That's uh, a good idea. That's all these posters one. on my wall, yeah, with yeah. all these guys' signatures from, you know, like Mike and, and Tice and stuff. So, um, all the yeah, been, yeah, iMag in Paris, I checked that out. Um, went to energy workshops, of course, in London. Mm-hmm. Um, also been to Eindhoven uh, and, you know, uh, the Netherlands to go to playgrounds um what what's else have i done the, what's the um because what's what's the unicorn one called trojan horse was unicorn that's yes one, how, one. how could i you know at least we forget but no no andre's event is incredible i went to that for the first time last year and it was just like an entire week of just my mind being absolutely blown hmm. um the artist that had come talk and you know and that was the year i met rafael gazetti who is now probably one of you the, know my, the most my, famous my, artists <laughs> Well, Raf is a Raf is a legend, but like he's just a really good friend now, and I'm yeah. really to have him in my life. Um, he's probably one of the few people I think in the industry that's really took an interest in uh, me and my career, and then just helping me along because, you know, luckily over the last couple of months, again through networking at THU, mm-hmm. um, I managed to get to work with him on his his new kind of um, character design classes. So I was kind of yeah. helping him. I remember you saying that that was so cool. Yeah, man. So it's been really, really good. So, but I've met a lot of people through uh, uh, industry events who are, you know, just really good pals now, and um, it's been just a great experience because you just get to meet so many like-minded people. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when you go to these events, and it's like you know, even at THU, it's like a thousand people or something go, but then it's like a thousand of the most dedicated and uh, focused artists you'll probably ever meet uh, in this entire industry. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's it's one of these things where people talk about, you know, like, ah, oh, is it like super expensive to go? But, you know, like recently, just a couple of weeks, maybe even just a month ago, what we're now in November. So, yeah, the end of September or the start of September, sorry, I went to uh, Lightbox Expo in L.A. And that was like, you know, the money I spent to get there and back, like, was ridiculous. A lot. But, <laughs> added up. But. The, the contacts I managed to get across there, you know, the people I met, I got to tour Blizzard and Riot and a couple other studios and, you know, meet people out there and get to, you know, catch up with Raf again and, and, you know, interact with people at my booth. And then the fact that, you know, like, which almost brought a tear at my, was, you know, standing at Raf's booth and I was talking away and people were like, I recognize your voice. And I was like, <laughs> okay. 
like oh, i know where you're from i listen to your podcast i was like holy shit like it was <laughs> you know i was i'd done a, a whole story uh going over on on the plane from because when we landed at chicago right. i had to get a correcting flight to lax and we we're just it was only about a two-hour flight but you know i was sitting uh just you know in the in the chair ordering a drink from one of the short s stewart and then um, this guy was sitting next to me and he was like are you gordon neil yeah <laughs> i was like what he was like yeah oh listen to your podcast i was that's like oh amazing. my oh, god that's mind cool. blown <laughs> small he's like, what the hell? <laughs> no he's like oh, I'm, I'm on my way to lightbox i was like oh me too but <laughs> oh it was so weird it was it was a really trippy event but um that's a highlight yeah, man, that's a highlight though. yeah definitely but then like it, it's it's not even about the reckon you know being recognized and stuff i mean that's great but even the, the times now with the podcast where you know because of the industry event or the industry knowledge i know because of going to events and speaking to artists yeah. the stuff i've passed on in the podcast you know i get emails occasionally or messages on on the facebook channel mm-hmm. or just in, in my email saying you know your podcast really changed my life or you know i had a, a young girl uh a couple of years ago i think even a year ago talking to me on email about how she was finally going to art school to be a, a games artist because mm-hmm. of my podcast so wow nice that kind of stuff is like prepare yourself ross it will it will come eventually it will, oh, yeah uh, the emails will be flooding in so it's, it's, yeah i've like, i've had my fair share of uh messages in my, myself it's, it's always a rewarding feeling because at the day it's about, yeah like, that's what we we're literally talking before the podcast even started like, mm-hmm. the reason why we do it is because it's it's just helping people it's like there's nothing better like, like you said like the fact that you went to la and someone mm-hmm. said to you right i listened to your podcast and it's like and just knowing the fact that you've been able to help someone through uh, just talking, like they've never met you, uh, yeah. they don't know you, but you've been able to change someone's life, like the girl that like you're saying, and like mm-hmm. it's such a long way, and it's, and it's the best feeling for you ever is just helping someone. I think it's just a natural aversion to, or not aversion, but a natural draw to being able to talk to people and, yeah, and exactly. inspire them. And, you know, I remember I was... <laughs> I had a moment and I'm, I'm not flexing on anybody it's just but you know I was I was sitting talking to a couple of students at the time and I think they were going to know on or, or, or one of the schools that they were in the art center and they were talking about oh, you know I don't know and the industry is really difficult and that and then you know I was like oh you know what fuck it man like why not just try like you know if people are sitting in your life and telling you that you can't do something then like just get those people out of your life you want to and exactly. I just and I, yeah. and I started I started ranting and just like going on and then <laughs> at the end of like five minutes I stopped talking yeah. and the woman's face was like there was like tears coming off her and I was like oh I'm, so I, I hope I didn't upset you and she was like no that was just like one of the most motivational talks I've ever had in my life that was so incredible that's what I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> and Raph like came at the back of me and he was like what have you done I was like no 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 she's happy it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> she's, it was a good thing it's good tears um, good tears <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely awesome. feel like I've got a a career in motivational speaking if, if art never took off but um do, i don't know man just do it yeah, yeah, yeah. do them both why not do yeah both? yeah exactly it could be a side gig for me um why no not? man it's like it's just a thing where i just always get super passionate about what i talk about and especially because i'm so passionate about art and this industry and the people in it it's, it's i could talk for hours that's, and hours about it that's the thing because yeah. it's like uh, like for example you talking right now like like i'm just listening because i'm having a blast just listening to you talk because it's like <laughs> like that's the thing it's like uh it's there's nothing like there's no better I was, who was i saying this to the other day oh yeah it was, it was one of my friends and um, i said mm-hmm. to her it's like there's no better feeling than hearing someone talk i just listen to them about how passionate they care about their craft like right. I, I like to me that well for me anyway i feel like that's such a like like you just talking right now i'm like I'll just keep listening. <laughs> like I'm just chilling right now. This is great. Yeah, I don't have to, no, I mean, have to say much today. <laughs> it's just a thing where I, I, I think I've spent so many years, especially in my younger life, being yeah. so de- demotivated, and you know, I, even stuff where you know I was I was bullied a lot in school, and right. I think there's a thing where I just want to see people always at their best, and of course, I mean, it's always a kind of double edged sword because you sometimes will speak to people and try to encourage them, but then if they're not at that point in their life where they feel they're maybe, you know, wanting to start their journey or they want to make a change, then you can sometimes be forcing that on people and, and, mm-hmm. and you've got to always pick your battles and understand when it's appropriate to say to people, like, you need to do something now, you need to change your life, you need to motivate yourself. And again, it's one of the things where I feel with mental health, it's it's definitely a, a difficult balance where you want to inspire somebody, but at the same time, you, want, you don't want to be too harsh that it, it turns them off the path yeah you have um, to be smart with what you're saying yeah for the the young woman i was talking to in la she was definitely like i'm at art center and i want this to be my career can you give me advice and i was just as brutally honest as i could be and tried to you know 
make her as motivated as I could be because I wanted her to do well. But then, of course, if, if someone was just starting in the industry or even just thinking about starting to draw art, you've got to be really delicate in the fact that you, you know you've got to say to them, look, you're going to have to make really maybe peace that you're going to be really crappy for a while, but then that eventually will pass. I mean, it's like yeah. there's a Jake in Adventure Time says this thing. I think it's like somebody sucking at something is a path on the eventuality to not sucking at it. So yeah. it's like, you know, there's always these things you can say that motivate people, but they really have to have the the, the patience. Stick, stick to itiveness to really get through stuff. And I think yeah. that's been definitely one of my downfalls the last couple of years as well, is just trying to not only focus on one thing, but try to have the the courage and determination to fail. Well, that's just, you. Uh, yeah. Sorry to cut you off there, because no, I, no. I just want to say one thing that you you said to me a while back that I have so much respect for what you did. And um, mm-hmm. so, obviously, you were talking to me a while back that you, obviously you wanted to do character art, and yeah. you're trying to figure out what was the thing that you wanted to do. And then mm-hmm. you were saying, with the way the industry was going, obviously getting in the door first was like the thing that you wanted to do. So you switched back to environment art, and yeah. then eventually, once you get back to uh, your groove and stuff you could then go back to doing what you want once you've got that kind of foot in if you know what I mean yeah I mean definitely the, the industry does allow people to kind of dodge and weave into things if they have the, the dedication and the passion to yeah. to change over I mean I, I was listening to an interview I think only recently and I'm trying to remember who what, specifically what the podcast was but um, I think it was maybe even the Flip Normal guys oh um, right okay, okay. Yeah, yeah they they done a podcast with a guy from Splash Damage I forget his name um but he had basically went from environment artist to character artist and he was you know working at splash damage doing environment art by day and then on his lunch breaks in the night he was doing 3d sculpts for characters and then he is now a character artist so yeah. um i need to try and find his name and say it to you. but anyway yeah the, there's definitely people i know in the industry who have made that flip who have went from one extreme to the other even one of my friends johan who's uh he's like shark mob just now but he done like ui design and had done ui design for a long time on, on even stuff like you know battlefront for ea dice but then he now wants to do full concept art and he's now getting the opportunities to do that because he's been doing that at night outside of his work mm-hmm. um so there's always an opportunity because i mean in a general sense art is art right like you know of course you can, yeah yeah you can, you can design a building in 3d you can probably draw a building in 3d so you know th- there's these overlaps where it's not like a complete career, career change it's just like a, a slight shift um, and I think it's also good for just people's mental health in general because that also allows you just to free your mind up in a different way of thinking and maybe being a bit less focused on one thing all the time. When, um, when it comes to um, like mental health and stuff, um, mm-hmm. what's what's helped you in the past? Uh, when it comes to this, um, oh God, is it simply it? just t- taking a break? Like, what's the main things? That's kind of I think I've helpful. I think I've took too much I've took too much of a break at times in life. So okay, <laughs> I mean, no, at least you're honest. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's the main thing. That's yeah, a good, yeah, yeah. good, good skill. No, I, I think it's just a thing where uh, I think for people in general, you know, I think people have seen me as somebody who is super passionate about the industry, but maybe totally unfocused in where his energy should lie and 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 the things I do. I think the the thing that people don't realize about me is even though I'm very outspoken and talk a lot, I'm mm-hmm. actually quite shy and quite anxious all the time. Okay. And I think in general, the thing that's held me back hasn't been the fact that I can't focus on something or I can't decide. A lot of it has been just my general fear of failure. I think it's just been a thing that's kind of lived with me through my life and mm-hmm. through some of my personal history is that I was never really taught that failure was a good thing. I was taught that failure was a bad thing. And, you know, whenever I failed initially when I was younger, it wasn't met with the greatest response. And then throughout my adult life, that's been how I've kind of reflected on failure is that it's been something that's been really difficult for me and something I wanted to avoid. Whereas, you know, people in the industry who are professionals would say something like, you know, I'll fail hard, fail fast. It's really the way to get better, and that totally is legit. Like that is how you get better in this industry. You have to go out and make failures that are artworks, and then you know push them to the side, and then keep going and make other stuff until eventually you're not failing anymore. You're succeeding. Um, but I think it comes down to how failure is perceived in our our life, especially at a younger age, and how your parents, your teachers, your friends react to how you feel to things. Yeah. Because even teachers in general, I know when I was younger, if I failed a test, I'd done really badly. There was definitely teachers who would scold me or, or even punish me because really? I had, oh, wow. yeah, oh no, definitely. Like, you know, okay. the, the, the times that I would struggle in class and I think one of the first classes, because I'd done pretty well early on in high school and I got 
half decent grades and I was in kind of some higher classes but then I remember we done like our prelims back then I don't know what they are now in high school but um like our, our kind of end year test thing oh no actually it wasn't an end year it was like a it was like a prep so it was like a that's why it was called a prelim it was like a before the actual test test yeah um, that's why I, because, I, I did the same as you it was called prelims at the time yeah so because I failed that um they automatically bounced me down to a, a lower class you know what I mean? And it was only because I think I'd maybe marginally got maybe, you know, just below what I should have got. I think maybe maybe five marks or something like that. But that was enough for them to be like, oh, he doesn't deserve to be in this class, so bump him down. Right. And to me, that was wrong because then that set me in a whole path of like, oh, well, what's the point? You know what I mean? If I'm going to just fail this and get chucked down different classes, like, why should I even try? And mm-hmm. I remember by the end of high school, you know, between, you know, a couple of different personal reasons and things that were going on at school, um, I sat in most of my final exams and drew <laughs> because really? Really? I, I, yeah, I didn't really want to pass. I didn't want to do anything. Yeah. I, I hate, I hated school. Okay. But that is a whole thing when I look back at it now about how people talk about failure. And I think it's just, it's definitely a thing a lot of, especially kids in Scotland, I think deal with where, you know, their parents are no very supporting and, and just didn't understand how hard it can be to be in school these days and, and learn the things you learn, especially because the college and university levels. I mean, there's, there's kids out there that are killing themselves because, you know, exams are so difficult and they just can't deal with the pressure. There's a whole, you know, name for it and everything for a lot of young kids. But then I think it's very, it's a very good thing to have find mentors and people in the industry that can really pick you out of those dark spots and show you that it's okay to suck. Like, it's not a bad thing. It's just a step in the right direction towards not sucking. And, you know, I've been lucky, I think, in the last couple of years, maybe in the last year, I mean... I think I talked about it the last time we talked is that mm-hmm. I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't met Raf. You know, Raf has been um, a real guiding light in my in my life the last year and really shown me amazing the the avenues that I could take and things that could be possible if I really stuck in. And that and one of my other friends, uh, Dennis Glasky. Um, you know, Dennis has been a really good friend as well, and he's been helping me through a lot of stuff and and really cheering me on and and mm-hmm. showing me that you know it's okay, man. And you know, if you're not great, it's something straight away it's fine just keep going so <clears throat> finding people like that in your life is really rare and i think it's it's something that you really need to try and seek out <clears throat> i think especially when you go to networking events it can be something that you can focus on is trying to maybe find someone i'm not saying you, you know you're going to instantly find somebody like Raphael uh or dennis or, or people that are, are kind of higher up but even finding somebody that's maybe just a couple of steps ahead of you um, and just you know making friends and, and 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 spending time with them and feeding off their energy i think there's a quote i can't remember who by but it was something like um you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with i've heard so, yeah something like that yeah 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 definitely. so you definitely need people around you that can influence you and help you and have a group mentality of we want to succeed and that will you know because you hang about with people who just haven't got their life together you then yeah. it's hard to then come out of that funk and, and get your life together you know i mean so you really want to merge with these people at events as much as you can because not only are you getting to see these great talks and meet all these companies and recruiters but you're just getting to build a network of friends that you can rely on when um, that you, yeah uh, like i was just gonna say is like when it comes to like um so all these things that you've done uh throughout your career etc and stuff uh when it comes to you personally like, this is one thing that like, kind of like i guess will kind of bring a lot of this stuff together is like the concept of learning um in mm-hmm. terms of, like like so obviously you've talked to Raf for the years and um, you've um, gone through your experience through education and stuff has there been anything that's been particular that's helped you learn best like like obviously like people use like just common writing notes repetitively doing things uh, repetitively speaking to people to uh, things just obviously taking time has anything kind of helped you uh, learn mainly um i think it's hard to maybe put it down to just one thing yeah. i think the the takeaway that I've had from the five years, six years now, that I've been through the whole education system and going to events and meeting people and now the last year freelance work, I think it's just a general thing of, oh God, where could I pin this? I, th- I think one of the biggest things I would definitely say is networking. Networking is something that's helped me learn tenfold because when you're sitting with somebody like Raphael or anybody, you know, a lot of the guys I've met over the years, even the first year I went to industry workshops, you know, sitting in Mike's talk, mm-hmm. 
there's so much, you know, like his collective 10 years in the industry is flowing out into you in like half an hour. <laughs> You're just like, whoa. <laughs> just absorbing so much stuff. You know, I think that's one of the best things you can do for learning is just taking these people who have been in these positions for years and years and years, you know, the the elders, I, I use quotation marks, the elders, because they're really not that old. Um, yeah. um, it's funny yeah. enough because I'm actually, I think I'm, a, I think I'm two years older than Raphael, so it's, it's hilarious. Um, but uh, yeah, like the guys who have been through the whole slog of learning and doing things, the guys now who produce like all this content on CGMA mm -hmm. and you know Art Center and even you know stuff like Learn Squared, you know the guys Ash and Art across oh, the Mache stuff. Mache oh, yeah, he's oh, no yeah, good. Mache, he's so Mache, good. Mache is one of my original influences as well because Mache also had a, a podcast called Art, Art, Art Cafe. He's still so, doing um, it. They're, they're both doing it. It's still yeah, yeah it's still going. Um, but. Yeah, the people in the, who are now taking this knowledge and making these courses are the people you really want to pay attention to. And I think finding one of these guys to learn from is probably the best way to learn quickly because, um, you know, there's so many things that people have done over the years, they've tried and failed. Um, and things like Learn Squared and things like others, you know, like Cube Brush, like Mark Burnett's Cube Brush, even now. Yeah, like yeah. There's, you know, and Mark's, Mark's actually a really good example because, again, I met Mark through the podcast and luckily got to meet him in person at Lightbox. But, um, yeah, Mark now has launched Art School, which is, you know, for, I think, $600, which is, you know, like £500 or something. It's next to nothing. Right. He gives you an entire course that can last you two years that will teach you everything in art foundation-wise. For like $600. Drawing. For six, well, for yeah, $600. Years. I think he, he's, he's going to do, like, um like reduced rates and then sales over, the, over, like, Black Friday and stuff. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bought it as soon as like he mentioned it, and at the time he was doing a half price, so I think I paid maybe two hundred and fifty pound for it. Yeah. Um, but you know, Mark's uh course. I mean, the guy's been in Blizzard most of his life, and now has compiled a course which he feels is like the best way for people to build a foundation in art. So there's so much available now that you can learn from from these guys who are masters in their field. Um, even just picking up Scott Robertson's book and going through that in an afternoon will probably feed you more information than you'll ever get going through university now i'm not trying to bash universities here but there is definitely a, a a mentality of people in university where you know i'm trying to put this delicately but it's old you know, school yeah like there's just a like you said it's hard to stay current unless you've got lectures like ryan who well, are, it depends who, where you go that's the hard part about it a hundred percent yeah like you can go to some courses where that are maybe a bit lackluster or some people who like just overachieve all the time but yeah. you know ryan and Aberté are a good exa example in this country especially in scotland of people who are dedicated to their craft i mean i definitely know there's a couple of places in london that do specialized programs where you can go in i think for like 16 weeks and come out a games artist so I think it's being smart about how you learn and I think it's about working smart and not hard. Yeah. There's definitely a mentality with some artists I've met where they're like, if you're not drawing or modeling for 12 hours a day, you're a failure. Okay. That's totally, that's totally wrong. That's, that's the wrong way to look at things is that if you work eight hours a day, but you work smart to the point where, you know, you feel that you're getting a really good, uh, or you're, you're, do, you're making, you're using your time efficiently. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You don't have to, as the quote unquote, kill yourself. You know, you like, People see this whole thing as like a badge of honor. You know, I met some guys at studios who were like, you know, oh yeah, I remember back in the day we were doing 14 hour days and we were working yeah. seven days a week. And I was like, how are you still married? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how do you ha how do you have a life? Um, I mean, I used to be the same culprit. I used to kind of, um, well, just like it was similar to, um, back to the point you said earlier, it's like mm. the reason why when I was in uni that I worked so hard though was the, like I was, I was the same as you. I was like, because I said in my podcast the other day, I was like, I was, I was, mm. I was afraid to fail, and yeah. uh, like, I was just thinking, wait, it's the only way for me to get any results then was overworking, and then, and then I took a step yeah. back and realized it was actually just all about smart learning. Yeah, definitely. I think the way that fear will go when it comes to learning and work is it has two extremes, yeah. and we're both of those extremes. Like I'm the extreme where. I would do next to no work because I'm so afraid of even starting. Mm -hmm. But then you're the extreme where like you work so much because you just don't want to fail. So you're overworking. Yeah. So I think life in general, and I think now studios are definitely coming into a circle where they understand that you need to have that work-life balance. So there's definitely a mentality coming in studios now where people are like, yeah, it's five o'clock, you can go home. Like, don't worry about staying at the weekend or don't worry about staying you know overtime still exists in some sectors but i think sometimes it's hard to just not have that at all like i don't think you're ever going to squash it completely but 
as long as it's like paid overtime, you know, and the overtime is limited. And then during that overtime, you also make concessions for your, your your workers, like they can go home and see their family occasionally, or you bring food in for them, or you'll make, you know, concessions for them at work. So, the, you know, if they've worked super hard one weekend, they can maybe get a day off on the Monday or something, you know, so there's a balance. Everything in life is about balances. And I think for us, especially as artists, and especially because the industry has been grown over the last 20 years, I think there's been so many extremes. It's just trying to get back to just, a level playing field and something that's just even on every aspect of the industry mm-hmm. um so yeah not having you know crazy work hours but then occasionally maybe you need to wake up maybe need to work a few hours over time you know one night or something but you know not the extremes of like you know people sleep under their desks and not going home and you know eat, not eating because they're working so hard yeah. Uh, yeah there's definitely got to be a balance i think that the one thing i can take away from the last couple of years is just trying to be balanced in your life and not too many extremes of one or the other um and i definitely think that also comes to learning as well you know mark has said to people that you know even with his art school he would recommend two years but then people are like oh you know i'll do it in six months and it's like well that's great if you feel you're dedicated enough for that but at the end of the day you don't want to put your mental health or physical health at risk by pushing yourself too much like that's so yeah well i was just gonna say that's the thing though it's like um one it's one thing i've uh I've never understood and I think it just goes back to what people are getting instilled to when they're younger um, mm-hmm. is the fact that it's like people always think they have to do things so quickly and yeah. I'm like what's the rush like as long as you have enough yeah. money uh, to eat uh, and drink and sleep like, that's all you, yeah. that's all that matters it's like, there's no rush to get a job no definitely no I think especially when we left uh, university there was definitely a push that it was you know what's your next step what are you going to do next and you know people at the time even i was saying a couple of guys like oh you know you want to maybe go and do this or that or thing and then all the guys were like no you know i'm just going to take maybe a couple of months off after uni i'm kind of burnt out from Mm -hmm. doing work there and i was like okay i didn't understand at the time that it was okay to just you know have a break and of course yeah and not work so i think it's definitely a thing where it's been a very interesting six years since i left my job um i think it's just a thing where getting used to this different lifestyle and this different approach to work and because especially my job I had previously you know a lot of those guys you know had really decent wages and you know we definitely didn't work as hard as people in in this industry who get paid maybe less and you know when I think about it back it's crazy you know we could sit most of the day and do nothing and get paid to do it and uh, and now you know a lot of these guys who work in these these industries are just you know totally just you know work these 60 70 hour weeks and and don't get any rest but then some people thrive off it but it just depends again how you view life how you view achievements what success is to you um do you want you know to be working at blizzard at the highest echelon of of the gaming industry or do you want to be working in the studio where you have a more balanced lifestyle it's totally you know i think it just every studio is different as well i think one of the key things when you first get into the industry as well is is finding a studio that suits your lifestyle yeah. that's one of the biggest things i think people will have to overcome because you know like you and i know there's there's a lot of big studios that have the flashing lights that have the great games but then when you get there it might not be everything you expected and you know i definitely feel like Access had definitely one of the best work-life balances I'd ever seen in you mm-hmm. know, a studio or, or heard about because, you know, they work 10 to 6 and they don't do overtime or weekends. So, you know, people who have family, have young kids, are able to go home at night and see their family or see their kids and, and get away at the weekend and do things that aren't related to work. Um, even the difference between, you know, um, something... I mean, it depends. I didn't know too much. When I went to visit the guys in Blizzard, definitely there was an air of they were busy at the time because BlizzCon was coming up. But then... Yeah. I went to Riot to have lunch with one of my friends, Lydia. Awesome. Sh- shout out, Lydia. Um, <laughs> but she's also, L- Lydia Zanotti is an amazing environment artist, just full stop, so I'll just throw her name in the mix as well. But, <laughs> it's okay. Um, Keep but Lydia, <laughs> Yeah, but Lydia, uh, when we went to Riot, I met a, a guy there, Brandon, at the time, and he had came from several other studios, um, and he was like, you know, at Riot, like, I've, I definitely feel like this is the best work-life balance I've ever had in my life. So, you know, shout out to Riot Games. They were really... Um, he was said, you know, inspirational for him, you know, just giving him time away from his work to do things with his life, with his family. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, it's a it's a thing where finding that first studio is also great because you want to get a job and you want to earn money, but make sure that it is also right for right for you. you. Know, 
for you, for your mental health, for your approach to work, for for the things you want to achieve and how you want, you know measure success. But yeah, definitely finding that first studio that fits you is probably one of the harder things. And actually, you know, getting the job is actually just finding oh, one that you of course. you feel you feel like you're part of. Because even you know, like most offices, you know, you work with people in close box, close, close proximity, but you won't know until you're in that kind of environment until you know. You know, I, I, even just before we go, I, I wanted to just throw a, a question and you know, not a question, but a thing that people really should be asking when they go to job interviews. If okay. you're at a game, if you're at a game studio, and people are, are interviewing you and whatever else, and you're talking away, at the end they'll probably usually say, "Have you got any questions for us?" Yeah. And one question I've found that I've used that's thrown people off that I've been like, "Oh my god," is asking them, "What is your favorite thing about working here?" Because usually they'll be like. Oh, I never thought about that. I don't know what. What is my favorite thing? Because then, if they can't really think a good answer, that should be ringing alarm bells in your head. But then, if they're like, "Oh man, well, the culture here is great, and you know, I love working beside X, Y, Z, or this guy, or or oh, we have pizza Fridays every every thing in the month." Or that's a you know, great stuff. question. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, just like stuff like that. Because yeah, yeah. it's an interesting question to post to somebody who works there already, because they'll be like, "Put oh, them on the spot." <laughs> Yeah, what is my favorite thing about working here? I've never thought about that. I because then they might come up with something you know, totally even thought about that, like the pizza Friday, or just like yeah, or like yeah, oh, the work life balance is really good, or or we get really good bonuses, or you know, there could be a, there could be a ton of answers to that question, but you know, definitely it's something that I think will inform you about how you're going to be treated once you enter the door and what people will think. Because if you know people are like, oh, this is just a job, I didn't actually have anything favorite, then you're like, oh well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you find the truth. <laughs> but uh but no it's, it's definitely a thing i think that will we'll throw people in and it also adds i think points to you as well because people will be like oh it's a really good question but yeah. um but yeah no i definitely think especially the last interview i went for i was i definitely did ask that and um it was one that kind of made them kind of sit back and think about oh, what what actually does the yeah the most you got thing the about this yeah definitely yeah because i've got to be honest in the moment because they're trying obviously they can't stall for too long so they've got to yeah. be really like oh what is something i actually enjoy <laughs> doing here so I yeah never thought uh, that's a great one I'll, yeah my, my, my seat's really comfy my screen's really big i have the coolest <laughs> mouse on my desk so yeah um Perfect. yeah definitely want definitely one uh to end on but yeah definitely that's- i think i think the overall topic of this conversation is Get out there and make some friends, but always look after yourself as, as the main takeaway. Definitely. Um, so, um, as always, before we get into 500 seconds, so uh, once again, man, we always end the, the podcast with like 500 seconds of a bunch of random questions. Okay. Um, but no, like that's a great a great way to end the, the main uh, conversation of the podcast because when it comes to uh, just, just, just you as a person, you have to find out the truth, find out what you want to get out of it, find out... Um, and your only way to get in these answers is simply by asking and um, giving it a yeah. go and experimenting. Because without that, there's you're just going to be digging yourself a hole, and you, you want to keep uh, pursuing that goal of uh, finding the right place for you. Yeah, because it's such a it's such an overhaul to get in a studio to start with. If if you feel like you made the wrong decision, then you're in that culture. It's hard to then make the moves to try and get back out. I mean, obviously you can leave your job, but you don't want to be in that position where you're having to think about, you know, announcing something that you're working somewhere then you're leaving. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a whole thing. But yeah, anyway, so yeah. So um, as always, uh, on 500 seconds, um, which is always a nice fun little random bit of the podcast, we always fin- yeah. finish it with a bunch of random questions. Uh, as always, um, Gordon, uh, you can pass it any time. There's literally no pressure questions. So it's, just, right, it's, cool. it's purely just a bunch of fun random ones. Uh, yeah. Similar to the ones before, if, if everyone's unaware, well, actually, people won't know. So, I actually did a podcast with Gordon uh, about what four months ago, and something uh, like that, yeah. And we were just gutted because the audio didn't work, and oh, it was so good, that, it was so great to have a back. Like, no, <laughs> the pain. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. So, as always, we'll just start going with them. Right. Hey, cool. So, we'll start off with this one. If you were to work any other job that did not involve art, what would you do? Oh God, it put me on the spot right away. <laughs> um, I think it would probably be something music related because I did do a lot of music stuff when I was younger, um, playing in bands and singing and, and playing instruments. So yeah, something music related would be cool. Perfect. You're the first person to mention that of all the yeah. guests. Literally, <laughs> what, 58 get- episodes and no one said yeah. that yet. Yeah. Oh, uh, there you go. Uh, what's one... Right, this is, uh, this is a fun one. <laughs> yeah. This is the one that... This is an interesting one. What's one yeah. song in your playlist you would sing in the shower but too embarrassed to say? Oh God! I, 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 I could tell you my one if it, if it helps, helps you out. Uh-huh. So mine's High School Musical. I don't know if I'm embarrassed to sing it, but I definitely love Disney uh, songs, and I think uh, "Go the Distance" by Hercules is like great choice. Oh my God! 
it's like my inspirational song. Like I sing it to myself when like I'm feeling low or like I can't do anything. I like I sing, uh, go the distance. So yeah, that is a great choice. You can't go wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. such an amazing song. Oh gosh, I've got that in my head now. <laughs> <laughs> I can find my way. Yeah, that's it. Exactly, that's the one. <laughs> I can. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, I love yeah. that one. Um, yeah. Right. If you were to play, this is this is one of this is one I just changed up because I was I was like, you know what? Let's start adding more questions. Yeah. Um, if you were to play one game competitively as a career, what would you choose? Oh my god. Uh, oh <laughs> uh, it would either be Overwatch or Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, uh, why? What would what, what would be the reasons? I, I think because I'm I'm quite in the FPS. I have been for a long time, and I definitely feel like Siege has taken over my life the last year. So is okay. Overwatch. And I definitely feel like on a competitive level, they have really good esports teams and really good esports um, uh, cultures. So yeah, um, yeah. It, the, I think if it wasn't either of those two, it would be either Siege, Overwatch, or Hearthstone. Okay. Um, although the controversy has been mild, uh, uh, to, to say the least, on uh, the the Hearthstone back. But uh, yeah, like uh, definitely, there's a couple of games that I I go to when i'm just taking a break you know between art because they're quick you can jump in and out have a quick you know game or two and then pull yourself back out of them it's not like the days when i used to play warcraft and you know you were sat behind your computer for a whole weekend you know try to level so um mm-hmm. i like i like the kind of shoot in and out of uh no pun intended of those games yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah probably siege or overwatch yeah because now nah, mine's always a uh, mine's the cliche choice mine's always call of duty Funny enough, actually, you know, another great FPS that I really love, but at the same time, I feel the multiplayer in that has been something that has been super hard for me to get any. Like with Siege, I definitely feel like there's a an avenue that if you if you knuckle down and learn the basics, you can be pretty successful because it's only five on five. Um, but then with with COD, it's like it's so intense and so so competitive. <laughs> yeah, like you just get lost in a haze of like I don't want to play this anymore. Cause <laughs> it's like when i first started, first started playing PUBG and stuff it was Fair like enough. almost impossible so yeah right um biggest fear oh my god <laughs> you can never you can say pass I, I, honestly i think the, the honest answer to that is death i think right, the, okay. yeah, yeah. the, the I, fear I, of dying has been something that stayed with me for a long long time and i think that's why i wanted to have the podcast and have this career and have something that i really wanted to aim for because i almost wanted to leave a legacy behind that won't have me been forgotten that yeah, yeah. Sense? no no I, I completely feel where you come from that's, that's a, a great yeah, answer yeah. For, uh, for that one uh, yeah. uh, this well, this one might be a hard one because this one is always a hard one for me uh, favourite TV show oh my god uh, <laughs> you're just like what is these questions that I did not so expect many. Oh, I know, try there's, one. There's, I mean, there's, <laughs> no at the moment I think definitely it's Rick and Morty um, I mean I've got them tattooed on my arm for god's sake but I've never um, seen it I'm so oh, sorry. Man. I'm so yeah. sorry. Oh, Rick and Morty, man, you need to get it. Like, I think on a, a deeper level, I mean, at the, at the top level, it is a lot of just cringeworthy humour, but at the deeper level, when you look at Dan's writing, it's it's really deep in the world. You know, it takes a lot of stuff from H.G. Wells and talks about, you know, how, uh, I think for a lot of the, the stuff he talks about, how life is on a, on a cosmic scale meaningless and how like the world and the universe and the galaxy is so expansive is that we're such a tiny blip in it mm-hmm. um how, how can we matter but then i think rick and morty both explore those avenues of that even the smallest people in the, in the galaxy can make a difference to people's lives so i think in general that's why i've kind of taken on to that tv show so much recently i mean in general I, I mean i've loved a lot of tv shows i mean one of my favorite tv shows i think ever was um uh, Avatar: The Legend of Aang. Oh and, um, yes, yes, that's, that's, yeah. one, that's one of my favorite. I was talking yeah. about literally the same episode, we were, uh, same thing we were talking about in the last podcast. Yeah, because uh, I've got Aang also tattooed my, tattooed on my arm, and he's Avatar state. So last year, Ben, um, greatest thing ever. Yeah, 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 I really love it, man. I've been watching um, Korra and catching up with that. I managed to finish that recently. Right. Um, but I also just watched last night actually the the third season of Dragon Prince. And I know a lot of the guys who worked on Avatar are now working on Dragon Prince, and wow. it's even a couple of the same voice actors. So nice. Um, so on Netflix, if you haven't checked it out, give it a go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I did not expect you to say that. That's a great, great choice. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is the most random, uh, random question yet. It's the last one, so be ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, if you could turn any animal in the animal kingdom into a small pet, uh, and it would never age or whatever, what would you choose? I bet everybody's picked Dairo for something like that. Eh? So, um, so far, we've had like a pet dragon. Um, I was uh, always saying that mine would be uh, getting a pet shark and putting him in an aquarium. Like, a, imagine having a miniature uh, great white baby shark. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh, yeah, 
Um, I'm trying to think just animal wise. I mean, like, I mean, I've been a dog person all my life, so I, I think in general, I, I think Dire Wolf would be really cool to have as a pet as long as it was obedient. But um, I don't know, man. Like, it's, it's a really difficult one to think because there's limitless possibilities, right? You could have any animal in the world, yeah. even mythical. So you're like, talking about dragons, but yeah, I think wolves in general would be good for me because um, they are so loyal to our fault sometimes, mm-hmm. just in general with people. So um, I don't know how wolves would interact with people, but yeah, I think wolf in general would be a really cool animal to have as a pet. Perfect, because that's one we've not had yet on the show. We've had so oh, many yeah. variations, uh, so many random ones as well. I'm, like, I'm just throwing out all these these classic one-liners that people have just never thought of. There you go. Your best 500 seconds yet, Ross. Well, there's, there's so many things I, I need to go read into and check out. I'm like, what is, what is all this information? I'm, I'm so new to it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, exactly. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on the podcast. This has been a blast having you on the show. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for having me on, Ross. And I just want to say, man, like, um, you're definitely doing something really awesome. And I'm really honored to be on it because I think what you're doing is something that most people should be doing with their careers and trying to feed back into student loops and, mm-hmm. and help students come up. And it's definitely a thing like, uh, you know, I'm really glad somebody else of, of you know, our level is definitely jumping on the bandwagon and, and helping with these these students and, and people in classes that are really struggling. And you're definitely doing something that, like, I'm really impressed with and I know other people are. So, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that, man. That uh, generally means, uh, really means a lot. Cause, uh, yeah, man. It's like, you know yourself, it's like, like when you're when you're going through studies is like there's so many things that you're trying to get answered and sometimes you don't get them answered and you're trying to figure out well how do you progress and like that's yeah. the reason why i did the podcast it was to help yeah. people out same reason for you and uh, yeah it, it always means a lot when a guest comes on and just tells their story and it gives the gives them that perspective so um as always what uh, before we finish once again everyone should name make sure to go check out his work all the links are in the description below uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast the podcast is like i said weekly series uh literally on every platform possible leave a like if you have any questions as always leave a comment in the description below and until next time we will see you in the next podcast thanks for listening